it is uh, 701, so thank you all for coming out. My name is Jared, and I work here at the Monroe County Local History Room, which many of you I know are regulars here, and that's wonderful to see you back. If you haven't been here before, uh, please do stick around and look around at, the, at, our, at our displays before you leave. We try to connect people to history in an interesting way, in a meaningful way, and we do that through exhibits, we do that through our research library behind you, and we do that through public programs. Tonight's program is the third in a series that we do during the winter called History Live. And just before we introduce Ward and, uh, and the program for tonight, I just wanted to let you know that next month, next month is our final program, and it's going to be a, another very interesting topic. It's called Fires, Floods, and Freaks in Nature. And that's going to be on Thursday, the second Thursday, is that the 12th? Yeah. The 10th, thank you, the 10th. <laughs> okay, I have little green handouts on the table where you signed in that has everything you need to know about. But basically, the second Thursday of, uh, of next month, and it's going to be, we're going to look at the Sparta flood of 43, the Toma High School fire of 43, and then the, the Kendall cyclone of 57, is it? Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, fascinating. And if you know anybody who could tell stories about what it was like to experience those things, invite them, because that's going to make it extra special. So, one other thing I wanted to advertise or let you know about, to, have you ever wondered, are you a descendant of a Mayflower pilgrim? If you think you are, or wanted to know if you are, um, there is a special program coming up April 14th at the, at the Senior Center in Toma at Superior Avenue at 3 o'clock on Saturday, April 14th. I'm going to have this uh, on the same table in the back where you signed in, excuse me, in the hallway where you signed in. But this is a program that you can learn more about the Lineage Society and uh, what it means to be, um, to belong to the, the, the Mayflower group. Is there anything else you'd like to say about this, Kathy? There is parking in the rear, so if you can't find a spot up front, don't worry about it. All right, don't worry about it if you can't find parking in the, in the front. That is parking in the rear of the Senior Center in Toma. It starts at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. There you go. Is there anything else we'd like to announce, Hannah? Hannah also works here at the History Room. Uh, thank you Stay for, for juice and cookies. Stay for, that's right, we'll have refreshments when this is done. And uh, without further ado, we are, now, we are now acknowledging America's 100 years involvement with uh, World War I. It's been 100 years ago that World War I is, it was going on, of course, and America was in it. And so tonight, we are pleased to have Ward Ziski with us to tell us more about what, is, what caused this war, and what was America's role in it? And then getting down to the personal level, the very real level, of what was it like to be a soldier in the war, and what did he wear, what did he use, and so on. Um, obviously, we had troops from Monroe County serve over there. Several of them never came back. So I hope that through this program, we can understand better this war that many people don't know a lot about. So without further ado, would you help me welcoming Ward Ziski? Oh, uh, World War I may not resonate with some of you, so um, when I say World War I, um, what comes to mind? Trenches. What's that? Trenches. Trenches? Okay. What else? Prussia. What's that? Rationing. Yes, yeah. Okay. What else? Machine gas. Gas, gas machine guns. Mustard gas. Mustard gas. Yeah. <laughs> Influenza. Lusitania. Lusitania. Prussia. Prussia, yep. Yeah. Oh, good. So I got some people with some knowledge of World War I. I was hoping someone would say Snoopy and the Red Baron, but uh, <laughs> uh, wait for Halloween. You can run it. It's, uh, I'm sure most of us grew up with it. But anyway, um, okay, World War I. Um, What's the event that, that touched it off? Shooting. The uh, assassination. assassination of Archduke. Of, of Archduke? Sinking of the Lusitania. Sorry, already, okay. Well, I'll better get started here. Okay. <laughs> anyway, and, and John here got it right. But um, there's a little more that goes into it. So I'm going to go back a little ways with the European history. Um, of course, um, at this time, uh, you know, it's the turn of a new century. The um, European powers have been acquiring colonies in Africa, in Asia, and so forth, all over the world. And 
Okay, what does that have to do with them going to war? Well, guess what? They're rivals for these colonies. They want to see these colonies overseas. Well, at times they bump heads over acquiring this land overseas and acquiring islands. So there's that rivalry between uh, Britain, France, um, Russia, and then of course uh, Italy, and then Germany is a latecomer to colonies. Because remember, Germany is a new player on the world stage. They only get become united into one country in 1871. So obviously, um, Britain and France, they're much older. They've been united countries for much longer. So one of the things is they're a new um, power um, broker. Okay, they're a new power broker. You know, they're, um, and they're also, they are industrializing um, and becoming a rival to Britain. So also, um, Germany's trying to get colonies. They're also trying to build a world-class navy. And that, of course, upset, 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 uh, uh, upsets the British. Also, that uh, the Germans did defeat France in 1871. So France is a little upset with them. So, now, where it really begins is the Balkans. The uh, assassination of Franz, uh, Francis Ferdinand. Let me go into the Balkans a little bit. Okay, everyone knows about Turkey, right? Well, at that time, Turkey used to be, the Ottoman Empire used to be a lot larger than it is today. World War I made it have the boundaries it has today, basically. But prior to World War I, Turkey um, controlled the area of Palestine, <coughs> Jordan, <coughs> Lebanon, um, Western Saudi Arabia. It also controlled like Iraq and so forth. So it goes way down in there. It also had European possessions. Bulgaria, Serbia, and so forth. So it was big. Well, Turkey was losing power and it was basically being evicted from Europe. So there's two Balkan wars <coughs> that take place in uh, 1912 uh, and 1913. And what happens is, the, in about 1908, Austria, now Austria is a huge at this time. It's Austria-Hungary. It consists of um, Austria-Hungary, the territory that was, or the country that was Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, I mean, it was massive. It had acquired uh, Bosnia, and um, the Bosnians didn't like that. They wanted to be part of Serbia. So when the Archduke was assassinated, the Austrians, of course, blamed the Serbians for doing it, and they had a hand in it, um, and they wanted to punish Serbia. And of course, who are, the al who are, who are Austria's allies? Well, Germany and Italy. So the Austrians asked the Germans, hey, if we uh, sock it to um, Serbia, will you back us? This is the famous blank check, where uh, Germany really doesn't think it over and says, yeah, we'll back you whatever you do. So what happens is, is Austria um, declares war on Serbia. And then, of course, Russia, who sees Serbia as a, as a, um, a fellow Slav nation, they uh, mobilized to uh, attack Austria. So then Germany declares war on uh, Russia. Well, France, of course, is an ally of Russia. So then Germany declares war, at least they declared war, you know, before they started something, on France. Okay, so, 
what the Germans do is they say, okay, we're trapped here between uh, France and Russia. Of course, the Austrians are now attacking Serbia and actually losing. Uh, but anyway, so the, what Germany did, it's um, called the Schlieffen Plan. It's a preemptive strike, which is what it was. That okay, if we can knock France out of the war quickly, then we can turn and deal with the Russians. The Russians will take longer to mobilize. Now here's one thing that uh, mobilization in World War One, mobilization has been worked out to a fine art. Okay, and one of the reasons for that is railroads. Railroads, you can move a lot of men and a lot of equipment quickly. Of course, you have a lot of men because you have conscription. Everybody in Europe is um, conscripted into the army at some point. In fact, that's why some, some of our ancestors came here to the United States to avoid conscription in those European armies. So, you've got a lot of men being uh, in the armies, or men that can be called up, reserves that can be called up. They can get on the trains and they can move out quickly. So, it accelerates the timetable. And no one wants to be left behind. And you'll see that through history. Uh oh, we better do something, we better do something quick. So, Germany decides, okay, hit France, and then we'll uh, deal with the Russians. Well, they get into France, they, they go into the uh, northern part of France. France goes into the uh, southern part of Germany. Um, because remember, France is unhappy with Germany because of Alsace-Lorraine, which they lost in the previous war. But anyway, the Germans are stopped at the Marne River in France. Um, and the Russians um, mobilize much faster than the Germans thought, and they invade East Prussia. Of course, East Prussia doesn't exist anymore. It's part of Poland, but that's another story. But anyway, the Russians are stopped at Tannenberg. Okay, so what happens is everybody's stopped. Everybody's, er, okay. Now, what causes the stalemate? Anyone want to? Trenches, trench warfare. Well, trenches did not ca uh, cause weather. the stalemate. Winter weather. What's that? Winter weather. No. Machine nope. dunes. Machine not, dunes. not quite yet. They help. The real culprit is yeah. oh, yeah. breech loading artillery. Breech loading artillery. Um, this. Uh, each side has lots of cannons. These cannons uh, fire quite quickly, quite lethally. There's been a revolution in cannon, um, cannon design and ammunition since the Civil War, which was in the 1860s. Okay, it's 50 years later. Really no comparison. So what's happening is if you, um, these armies when they're out in the open and open, they're getting shelled to pieces by the enemy's artillery. In fact, that's when most of the casualties, that's the, that, that's the most, uh, the first months of the wars produce the most casualties in, in a small amount of time. Yes, there's a lot of casualties in trench warfare, but it takes a lot more time. So anyway, everybody starts digging in, of course, to avoid the shell fire. Now. Um, not only are they digging in, uh, one of the things that comes out of this is the steel helmet. Because when the war begins, no one's wearing steel helmets. But uh, what happens is, because your head is the high highest part of you, it's the most likely to get hit. So that's why each side develops steel helmets to protect your head from shrapnel, from guns and things like that. So. I'll pass this French helmet along. The French were the first to develop a steel helmet. Yeah, it's heavy. Wait till you wear it a little bit. 
That's right. You wear that long enough, you can look like Arnold Schwarzenegger from the neck up. Let's see. So, and then this is a British or American helmet, later an American helmet. And, of course, the famous German helmet. Okay, so both sides dig in um, on the Western Front. And um, so who do we have right now in the war? You've got Germany, Austria, Hungary. On one side, you've got Britain, France, and Russia on the other. Now, as the war progresses, more countries get drawn into it. Okay? But um, anyway, we'll get into that. Anyway, so they're entrenched. Okay, now the Germans are on Belgian soil and French soil. The Germans went through Belgium to um, attack France. They said to the Belgians, uh, let us just pass through. We want to get at France. You know, it's an unrealistic um, request. Of course, the, the, the Belgians fight and so forth. Anyway, so both sides are in trenches, and the Allies are more um, aggressive because the French, of course, want the Germans off French soil. Um, so the Germans, for most of the war, have better positions. Why? Because they are willing to trade some space. Hey, it's French territory anyway. Let's fall back to this better terrain that we can defend better. Then, um, and so the Allies, of course, they go as fat, far as they can. So a lot of times they have the cruddier terrain to uh, defend or attack from. Anyway, so both sides are dug in, of course. Um, and what's another thing that makes it hard to break through the enemy's line? Barbed wire, which was developed in 1873 in America. So, the Europeans can't say we don't give them anything. So, anyway, so they have barbed wire belts protecting their trench lines. Now, with the trench lines, uh, this becomes a, a, an art. But anyway, it's not just one long, straight line. It ends up being a series of lines. Okay, you've got your first, second, and third lines. So what happens is, usually your first line is going to get taken as the war progresses. Everyone gets better at attacking. However, as you try to take the second line and the third line, your reinforcements of the attacker cannot keep up. The, you know, the, the defender can reinforce quicker and doesn't have to go over that shot up ground and stuff to reinforce. So it's like an elastic defense. Well, anyway, so the, um, the attacks in 1915, of course, they use an artillery bombardment to try to soften the enemy. And uh, what happens is, uh, it's not, the machine gun really comes into its own. Don't worry, this doesn't fire. <laughs> so, anyway, but this is a German Maxim 08 machine gun. It's recoil operated. And, of course, this is how you can uh, sit at it to fire. But you can also adjust this so that you can make it really low. Um, and... Um, of course, it's water-cooled to keep the barrel cool. If it had everything it's supposed to have, it would have a rubber hose and a condenser can. So as the uh, steam boiled out of the water jacket, it would condense and go down into the can, and then you can pour it back in. Um, if the water boiled away, um, soldiers had uh, other ways if they didn't have any other water to refill it, if you know what I mean. Yes, they did do that. So, um, so between attacking over um, open ground through barbed wire, by the way, the barbed wire 
belts could get hundred yard, hundreds of yards <coughs> thick and be up to eight feet high. I mean, they, they really went all out. And so, and then with these, and then of course magazine loading rifles. Da, da, da. Ah. Basically, every, uh, everybody's using a type of bolt action rifle. And this um, is a Springfield 03 rifle, you know, five round uh, magazine, you know, operated with the bolt. So you can get off a lot of shots with these. So between that, that, and artillery, um, you can really put out a lot of damage. I'll put my bayonet on here for later. So, the the on the western front, the lines don't change. Uh, they don't go either way for 10 miles until we get into 1917. So for over two years, there um, the lines don't change that much. So there's just tremendous uh, casualties. Battles can be uh, months long. Uh, of course, they rotate troops in and out. But um, what happens is, of course, the trenches are unsanitary because you're dug into the ground. Um, the shelling, constant shelling, destroys the drainage. So they're very, they're waterlogged usually. Uh, of course, with all these uh, corpses and stuff, uh, this breeds lots of rats. So, and you can figure out what the rats eat. Um, so, and can get to enormous sizes too. So a lot, lot of uh, terrible things going on. So, there's the deadlock on the western front. How are we going to break this deadlock? <coughs> um, what they try to do especially the Allies. Well, the Germans do it too, but the Germans are more on the defensive on the Western Front because they, they have two fronts to choose from. You know, they got the Eastern Front and Western Front. We, Eastern Front, is, the Russians aren't as um, formidable due to supply problems and command problems and so forth. So, to break the stalemate, well, one of the things they start using is massive artillery bombardments. I mean, weeks of constant bombarding. And of course, so you, um, you have artillery crewmen that lead from the ears. So um, you actually have people that, uh, on the receiving end, that actually go mad under these bombardments because they're constant. Um, so they try to break through that way. The problem is, again, barbed wire, machine guns, uh, magazine loading rifles, um, because you have to stop the bombardment at some time. And when it stops, the enemy knows, okay, here they come, they come out of their trenches or out of their dugouts, you know, set up their machine guns and start firing. For example, like the Battle of the Somme, the British lose 60,000 casualties in one day. 20,000 of them killed. So, okay, got a deadlock, what are we going to do? Hmm, creative solutions. Aha! Uh -huh. Gas. We'll use gas to, to knock them out. So, in uh, April of 1915, the uh, Germans use chlorine gas. Okay, you all know about chlorine. You also know about swimming in the pool and your eyes hurt. Well, chlorine gas, you breathe it into your lungs. Um, it basically causes your lungs to produce liquid to try to wash it away. And it's called dry land drowning. You drown from your lungs. So they use it on the Allies. Um, the first gas attacks are with cylinders that they emplace and they let the wind blow it to the enemy lines. But uh, what they did is they used it, but they did not have uh, reserves there to break through like they needed to, the Germans did. So they kind of gave the game away. 
course, later, they develop other types of gas, both sides, of course, uh, phosgene, which is more lethal, but it actually kills slower, and you may not even know that you're doomed after you've been in a phosgene attack till hours later, and then you die from it. Um, mustard gas doesn't come about until 1917, the Germans uh, invented. Um, and they, we think of it as a gas, but it's actually a liquid. It's a liquid, and like a drop from an eyedropper will cause a two-inch blister. So it mostly causes blisters on the skin. Yes, you can breathe it in, too, but most of its damage, it's hurt right away. It doesn't start hurting till 4 to 24 hours later. So you don't even know that it, what's in store for you. So what would happen is guys would get it on their clothes, their equipment. They'd go down into a bunker with lots of other guys. Well, then it starts off-gassing in that confined area and then uh, causes problems. It was used to deny train, terrain to the enemy. But gas does not, gas does not um, break the stalemate. Yeah, it makes life a lot more horrible for everybody, causes casualties, and in fact, by the end of the war, both sides are using about 25% of their shells um, are gas shells. Because then you have sneezing gases so that guys can't put on their, their gas masks. There's all sorts of things. And yes, the United States used it too when we got in there. So yeah, we, we manufactured and used it also. So some people don't realize that. Anyway, so we've got the, the uh, British small, bro ugh, small box respirator here. And um, I would pass it around, but it's, it's kind of um, kind of rough. When you're a hundred years old, you'll be a little rough too. So, you know, it's got, it's like a snorkel that fits in your mouth. You got a clip for your nose. These things, of course, are uncomfortable um, and they do limit your efficiency. So, now this is the uh, German mask. The German mask, it's not as effective as the Allied mask. Uh, the Germans were running short of rubber, so they started making the masks out of heavily oiled leather. So, heck, I'll pass that around. Just be careful with it. You know, it's a... Uh, Is it a charcoal filter in the... It has, yes, it has charcoal and other stuff like that. And then to get around the... the, the uh, the charcoal, they started using toxic smokes, and then so they had to add other filters. And so, um, but that doesn't break the stalemate. So, how can we, what can we do to break the stalemate? Ah, we'll starve them out. Okay, and starving them out, that takes longer, but that's when the British put up their uh, sea blockade of the Central Powers. Central Powers, of course, are... Uh, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Turkey, and later Bulgaria. So they put on a uh, blockade on the Germans. Of course, the Germans retaliate with their um, submarines, and that's when you get the Lusitania in 1917, which is a propaganda victory for the Allies. And this is a poster to come out of the Lusitania sinking. And of course, it starts to hurt um, relations between Germany and the United States. But this is 1915. We don't go to war till two years later. So there's a hunt for allies. Of course, the Germans pulled the Turks into it um, because they promised in you know, the Turks the uh, a lot of their possessions that they've lost over the years. Plus, the Turks and the Russians have always had a rivalry. So they're happy to fight the Russians, and they actually do. Um, so Turkey gets involved. Of course, Italy, Italy started out on the um, Central Powers side, but it never fought on the Central Powers side. It sits it out. It says, yeah, we signed the agreement, but since you attacked first, we don't have to honor it, so we'll just sit this one out. 
So basically, both sides, the Allied powers and the Central powers, start offering goodies. You know, basically, if you join us, you'll get this out of the enemy's territory once the war's over. So the uh, British and the French offer a better deal to the Italians. You know, of course, it would come at Austria, Austria's expense. And Italy joins in 1915 against uh, Austria-Hungary, and then later against Germany. Of course, then later, uh, a deal is made with the Central Powers and Bulgaria. And Bulgaria joins the Central Powers side. Of course, then there's another one, Japan. Of course, Japan joins on the Allied side and gets um, out of that war, it gets Germany's island possessions like the Marshalls, the Marianas, and so forth, which our soldiers get to take from them in World War II. <laughs> so it, everyone starts getting drawn in for different reasons. But a lot of it is, you know, hey, want to want to get some goodies out of this deal. So um, or they feel threatened or whatever. So that helps. You know, get more guys on your side and maybe you can win. So, I know I've thrown a lot of uh, questions or things at you right now. Questions that anyone has. Has anybody lost? Yes? Could you depict the Eastern Front a little better for us? What was going on there? Okay, the Eastern Front. Um, the Eastern Front, basically, you have the Germans in the north and the Austro-Hungarians in the south. The, um, it's more fluid than the Western Front, but remember, it's big. So there's a lot of area to cover, and you know. So even though you can, like, especially the Central Powers, the Germans can crush the Ru Russians, they're able to retreat and reconstitute. Um, same thing with the when the Ru Russians launch offensives, they usually direct them toward the Austrians. The Austrians are not as formidable as the Germans. And one of the reasons they aren't is Austria-Hungary is multi-ethnic. It's got not only Austrians, which are basically Germans, and Hungarians, but it's got Romanians, it's got Czechs, it's got Slovenes, oh geez, um, Croats, it's got a lot of different, and some of these different minorities do not feel, um, eh, they don't really want to die for the emperor. So they're more, more of them surrender easily or run away. So the, the, the Austrians are weaker, and so the, the Russians will usually attack whenever they get a chance, the Austrians, yes. So was the war actually fought on uh, ground sovereign to the Germans or Austria? Or was well, it, it started uh, actually um, in East Prussia. The, Ger the Russians launched an offensive into East Prussia, which is Germany. Um, they were thrown out. And so a lot of the fighting actually takes place in Poland. But Poland is part of Russia at this time. Uh, there's no independent Poland. It's part of Russia at this time. So a lot of the fighting takes place in there. And the Russians last longer than anybody thinks they could. Because they, they had lots of devastating defeats, but they still... Uh, they still hang in there, and um, it's not. And also, of course, they're fighting the, the Germans, the Austrians, and the Turks. The Turks are trying to come up from the south, and the Russians are actually investing the Turks. So th that's the Eastern Front. Of course, um, in 1916, there's a huge uh, the Brezhnev offensive, which uh, really hits the. Um, hits the Austrians hard, um, and then Romania joins the Allies, and they get flattened by the Central Powers. One thing the Central Powers are good at doing is combining the forces of 
um, Austrians, Germans, Bulgarians, Turks, in taking out their opponents, such as Serbia, and then later Romania. So, but uh, Russia, of course, um, we all know about the um, revolution of uh, 1917, March 1917, when the Tsar is overthrown. Okay, but Russia does not drop out of the war yet because the pro provisional government decides we're going to continue fighting the war. And part of that is there's a lot of allied pressure on the Russians to stay in the war. Um, Russia does not drop out um, until the uh, November revolution of the Bolsheviks under Lenin. That's when they finally are out of the war. And then there's a treaty in March of 1918, Brest-Litovsk. So that's kind of a, the, um, well, one other thing, the German treaty of Brest-Litovsk is so harsh that um, what it does is it invigorates the allies on the Western Front because they say, ooh, look what they'll do to us if we give in. Um, also, the Germans, uh, they have to have so many occupation troops in Russia for all their goodies that even though they do ship a lot west, they could have shipped more, and that might have made the difference. Not sure. Okay, does that answer the question? Yeah, it's very interesting. It's not much that's written about. More, we're, as Americans, we're schooled on the Western Front most generally. Right, right. Well, and one thing is, um, with the Russian front, when the Russians dropped out of the war, it made more Americans, um, I guess, be pro-allied. Because here, Russia was not a democracy. It was an autocracy. So when the, when the czar fell, people thought, oh, good, now they've got a democratic, you know, government that represents the people. And, um, you know, the Bolsheviks haven't taken over yet. But so it's um, another, so that is, um, well, we'll get into that. So um, I'm going to fast forward to American involvement. First of all, I just uh, want to show you um, what footwear from back then. Of course, Rubber soles are pretty rare, so you got to have uh, the uh, hobnails. Keeps them from wearing out and also gives you some traction. So, what's America doing at this time as the war is going on? And, um, of course, America is trying to stay neutral. Most Americans want to stay neutral. Now they, um, some, you know, there's people who are for one side or from the other. Um, however, several things turn most Americans, it's a more pro-allied powers, you know, Britain, France, Russia, than pro-central um, powers. Okay. First thing is what they call the Rape of Belgium. When Germany invaded Belgium to get at France, of course, they're seen as an aggressor, which they are, of course. And uh, Germany, um, when they did invade Belgium to get at France, they were kind of harsh, to say the least. They, um, they employed firing squads, uh, I guess, they, somewhat liberally. However, what happened is, is the British were able to cut the Atlantic cable so uh, from Germany to the United States. Mm -hmm. So we get most of our news in World War I from the British perspective. And this is where the uh, propaganda really comes into its own. Because the British invent all sorts of horrible atrocity stories about the Germans. And, you know, about killing babies and cutting off hands and all sorts of just really vile stuff that the Germans aren't doing. 
which later in World War II, when they actually are doing, doing it, um, it's not always believed because of what came out later after World War I. It's like, wait, they weren't doing this stuff. So the British are, are really heavy on the uh, propaganda. Now, of course, also with the blockade of the Central Powers. We've got that blockade of the Central Powers. Of course, we can't trade with the um, Central Powers because the British won't let us. Of course, we're hacked off at the British somewhat until the British and the French start buying lots of stuff from us. But, oh, okay. Because, you know, so we start buying, they start buying a lot of stuff from us, and they start buying a lot on credit. <laughs> okay, so if they lose, we're not going to get our money back. You know, how are they going to repay the loans? Actually, they never really do, but that comes later. But so, we got a financial stake in this. Now, another thing is the Germans, and I don't know how much America at the time is aware of this, but the Germans are sabotaging uh, some of our munitions plants. Why? Because we're selling it to the Allies. So there are some, they're doing some of that. Um, so, what to draw, those are some things that dr help draw America into the war. Now, um, of course, the um, unrestricted submarine warfare. Remember the Lusitania in 1915? Well, the uh, German Navy finally um, per, uh, persuades the Kaiser to reinstitute unrestricted submarine warfare. And so they do in January of 1917. And that really hurts re uh, relations between the United States and uh, uh, Germany. The Germans think that they can starve out the British before America could really make itself felt. So that's why they do it. And then there's another thing. Um, the British were, um, they were tapping our, they were reading our diplomatic messages. Okay, so now the Germans, we were allowing the Germans to use our diplomatic uh, um, communications. Well, what happened is in Mexico, in Mexico starting in 1911, Mexico is racked with revolution. And in fact, you probably heard of Pancho Villa and the raid on Columbus in March 1916. And of course, General Pershing and the punitive expedition that goes down into Mexico and so forth. So, and later it doesn't catch Pancho Villa, but anyway, so the uh, Germans say to the Mexicans, you know, if we get into a war with the United States and you join us, you're going to get Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of California back. That'd be good. <laughs> You're all in Texas. I think that was in the deal. But, but um, so the British get wind of this, but they can't. They can't tell us right away. But they figure out a way. To, so they don't want to let us know that. Hey, oh by the way, we're listening to your communications. We're tapping your cables. But they do find another way to spill the beans, and it comes in uh, March of 1917. So of course now we've got the. Uh, unrestricted submarine warfare, and then um, also we've got the Zimmerman telegram, as it's called. Also, uh, we, we think that the Allies are stronger than they actually are. So we think, ah, it won't be, take us that much if we join the Allies to win this thing. And of course, the um, Russians have have um, gotten rid of the czar, so now they're democratic, so this could be a war for democracy. So, um, now it's kind of interesting, there were, there were three types of Americans, ethnicities that were against going to war um, with the uh, central powers. One was the Irish, 
the Irish in America don't like the English, so they didn't want to be on the side with the English. So that is something to consider. Of course, German Americans, <coughs> uh, for obvious reasons, um, also Jewish Americans didn't want to be on the same side as the uh, Russians, because the Russians are uh, doing pogroms, which is basically in Poland and Russia, uh, you have the Russians that are surrounding Jewish villages in those places and killing or driving off the inhabitants. So that's why that, that's what actually starts Zionism, where they start going to Palestine, was uh, what the Russians were up to. Anyway, so we do join, um, and our navy, our navy actually is uh, makes quite a difference. We've got, and we we get the English to adopt the convoy system, which helps cut down the um, uh, U losses to the undersea boats, the U boats, the submarines. But uh, we're really not prepared for war because you know we just had a very small army. Nice Navy, but a small army. So we have to get it ready. Now, uh, what the Allies do is they, uh, they look at us sort of like Kelly services. You know, you know, temp, temps. You know, yeah, just send us your men and we'll uh, um, put them in our armies and train them up and da 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 da. Well, um, General Pershing, who's the commander of the American forces, is basically all the hell with that. And uh, President Wilson goes along with Pershing. And um, so luckily our men are not fed into the Allied armies as replacements. And there, there's quite a bit of acri uh, acrimony between the Allies because they want our guys. And we're saying, nope, we'll fight as an independent American army. Um, eventually, we do kick some units um, loose to the French and the British in division strength, whole divisions, to meet the German offensives of 1918. Because um, what happens is, is the, okay, the Central Powers have crushed uh, Romania, crushed Serbia, they've knocked Russia out of the war. Um, ah, <coughs> farewell to arms. You ever read that story by Ernest Hemingway? It's about Caporetto when the Germans and the Austrians really put the screws to the Italians. Um, there was a movie a few years ago with <coughs> Ernest Hemingway about that. Yeah. Anyway, so the, the, the Germans decide we get before the Americans uh, can really make their presence felt. We've got to win the war. So they may launch a series of five offensives starting in March 1918, which goes through July 1918. Now, they have revised their tactics, and they're able to punch through, uh, the, knock the Allies back quite a bit. <coughs> but there's one thing that there's a problem. They knock the Allies back, seize a lot of territory, but, and they do break through in some places, but here's the problem. Transportation. It's World War I. Everybody still walks. Or if you have horses, and um, another thing, yes, you have trucks and stuff, but they're not the trucks of today. Like the Liberty truck, which is a cargo truck that we use, it, it, it's going 15 miles an hour, and that's flat out. And you wouldn't really want to be doing that anyway because the roads are very rutted and bumpy and so forth. Tanks, your, which the Allies start using tanks quite a bit, um, their cross-country speed is uh, the fastest one, I guess, was... Yeah, they're basically walking speed. There is one that's like 10 miles. The British whip it, but there's not that many of them, and that's still... It's about three miles, two to three miles cross-country speed. That's pretty slow. And there, there's reliability issues. So 
Anyway, it's also this being able to exploit the breakthrough. So what happens is the Germans, they don't have many tanks anyway. I always think of Germans with tanks from World War II, but in World War I, mm -mm, they've got a few, but nothing like uh, you think of. So they, we stop their offensives, um, and then we start counterattacking. And now, of course, you got the British in the northern part of the line, the French in the middle, and the Americans in the bottom. And so the series of Allied offensives uh, start pushing the Germans back. Now, what's happening, too, is Germany's allies are starting to falter. Okay, the first one to fall is Bulgaria at the end of September. And... Uh, so now the, the uh, uh, allies can come up through Greece. And of course, um, the 30th of October, I think, is Turkey is finally defeated. And um, so all through Palestine and up to Damascus, the allies go. So Turkey's out. Um, I think like the 3rd of, uh, 3rd of November, Austria-Hungary comes apart. So Germany's alone. Germany is also going through um, massive uh, unrest, strikes, um, and uh, mutiny by their navy. So that's why they throw in the towel for the armistice. <laughs> but, uh, okay, I got a little ahead of myself. Um, so, questions so far? Okay. We'll go into the, the U.S. uniform. I know people ask this. Yes? Where's Japan now and all of this after all the other ones are? Yeah, what's that? Where's Japan and all this now? Did they ever join it? For... Well, yeah, they joined on the Allied side. Okay. And they basically, they took the German base at Tsingo or whatever. It's in China. And then they uh, relieved Germany of their Pacific possessions. And then they called it a day. <laughs> Which is fine. They, they, they still uh, kept the Germans out of the out of Asia. So, um, but uh, they only had three hundred casualties in World War One. They did they did quite well. Yes. Oh, it's happened in like Africa. Africa, yes. The uh, Germans have four colonies, um, and you've got Togo, which is. Um, Got Togo, uh, Angola. Um, let's see. There's one other, and then of course the, the famous one is Tanganyika, which is by uh, oh those people that run real fast. Kenya. Kenya, yes, that's right, that's right. So um, that 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 colony um, holds out until 21 November 1918, but the other three are. Gobbled up by and and gobbled up by the Allies, and in fact, with the Versailles Treaty, the Allies gobble up all government and private German stuff, property in those colonies without any compensation. So, um, but that's what happens in Africa. Yes. So, when did the Americans actually <laughs> land in the European continent? Good question. And now, right away, we sent a division over in like, uh, let's see, what is it, like June 1917. But we really do not get into the fighting until uh, the summer of 1918. So we're arriving, but uh, we don't want to get fed into this meat grinder. So... We're uh, coming into the south of France and going through training. As the Germans launched their offensive starting March 1918 through the summer, that's when we start kicking a few units up there to meet those offensives. So it's, but it's really the summer of 1918 <coughs> that we really uh, start getting into the fighting. Now the thing is, but our presence was a big boost for the Allies, because of course, they know that we've got them, to, to, they've got two million Americans eventually over there to back them up. Uh, you know, and of course it hurts the German morale because they now, okay, now we're fighting against uh, the uh, 
Americans too, and they're bringing you know new troops and stuff like that. Um, of course, the Allied um, hunger blockade is really biting by 1918. So there's there's food riots and stuff in Germany going on. But yes. So the casualties were pretty tremendous, though, for the essentially a, what a seven month occupation. Well, we lost about 160,000 from all causes, um, which really, I don't think I'm unfeeling, but compared to everybody else, it's not that much. Uh, for example, Germany loses 1.8 million men. The um, English lose 900,000. The And this is just dead. France lose about a million and a half. Uh, Russians, oh, the, who knows, but it's a lot. So there's, we get off pretty light. You know, but we're really only in the fighting from uh, the summer of 1918 until November 1918, a short time. Um, now, oh, 1918, another thing someone mentioned, influenza. Influenza kicks in in 1918 and uh, kills 18 million people worldwide. So it took us human beings uh, four years to kill <coughs> 9 million of us. And it, the influenza took twice that number in one year. So, yikes. So, yes? Uh, can you uh, expand on the Army Air Corps, their activities? Okay. Ah. Yes. Um, flight, like Snoopy and the Red Baron. Okay. I, I usually bring that book, but I for, couldn't, I for, didn't bring it tonight, but everyone loves that book. But anyway, okay. When the war begins, of course, flight, there are airplanes, um, but there's no fighter planes. There's no bombers. The first planes in World War I are used for reconnaissance. So, going over and peeking at the enemy. So, you know, you're going over looking at the enemy, he's looking at you, and so forth. Well, then these planes see each other and say, what do we do about him? Or, you know, so first of all, they start bringing rocks and bricks and throwing them at each other. <laughs> and then they even... Um, develop darts. You know, like, remember yard darts? Yeah. yeah, they started having these darts, and they started people killed by them. So, then of course somebody brings a pistol, you know, and so anybody who's John Wayne-like, you know, he can really, you know, take them all out with, but anyway, uh, then someone brings a rifle, and someone then brings a machine gun. Now, of course, the um, machine guns, you know, you'd have like an observer, or you'd have to mount it above the wing, you know, how you ever hit anything. So the French come up with the idea, they put deflectors on the, pe on the propeller. So some bullets are hit these deflectors, and, well, that's bad too, because some pilots get killed by one of those ricocheting bullets come back and hit them. The Germans are the ones that develop the uh, synchronization gear so that the gun stops firing when the propeller goes in front of it. So, and so as the war goes on, you get fighter planes, you get bombers, you get big bombers that actually uh, bomb London. This is nothing like World War II, but it's big if you're on the receiving end. Uh, the Germans also use um, uh, dirigibles. Um, to uh, do bombing and scouting. So, uh, and uh, then there's also balloons. A lot of, both sides use a lot of balloons for scouting. You know, tethered and you can see the enemy's uh, lines and so forth. I know someone's gonna, gonna ask me about the parachute, right? <laughs> what about the parachute? Yeah, thanks for the parachute, okay. The, um, of course, when it first starts, there's no parachutes. So um, it's the balloon observers that develop the parachute. Because when you're in a balloon, you know, hey, great view. Oh, here comes an enemy plane. Bummer. 
you know, then it bring me down quick. You know? <laughs> and then, you know, it's filled with hydrogen. Yeah. You know, I want to get out of here. Well, it's like, poof. So, so the balloon observers start having parachutes, you know. It's always nice when you can make a hasty getaway. So, the uh, pilots, and then some of this is a little myth. Some of this might, is, it's true and, but anyway. So the pilots first see that. Of course, the knights of the air, you know, you know, true men, we don't need parachutes. That's unmanly, you know. So they don't have them for a little bit until you have that one individual that says, mm, I don't know, I'll sneak one into the plane. You know, if I need it, it's there. Of course, this individual eventually gets shot down, parachutes to safety, and of course, then the floodgates open. <laughs> Everybody, you know, no. You, if you want to see a similar thing, like at work, take a package of cookies and don't open it and sit it on the table for everyone. <laughs> It'll stay there all day. And once it's open, it just disappears in 15 minutes. So. But yeah, and so airplanes back then are actually their canvas and their wood. So that's why the American, like the American canteen, model 1910, it's made of, of uh, aluminum. Well, you didn't need aluminum for airplanes in 1914, 1918. They're canvas and wood. So you'll see that's World War I. In World War II, they start making them out of steel and other things because they need that aluminum for the airplanes. So yeah, um, that comes into its own aircraft. You know, of course, with uh, devastating consequences for the civilian population in World War II. Because that's when you start having these massive bombing raids and saturation bombings and to end with the atomic bomb. Yes? They drop bombs, right? I mean, they hand, did they hand drop them? Or? Yeah, they, uh, well, they, yeah, they had grenades and they had bombs that they'd throw. And then later they developed bomb racks that uh, underneath the plane and you would pull a lever. But still, it's nothing. It, the planes aren't that powerful. <coughs> and so the bombs aren't that big. It's still scary when they're Flow, you know, being dropped on you, but it's nothing like, you know, it's not that effective. More of it's a psychological thing. Because you're aiming, aiming by eye, you've got a small bomb. You know, planes back then about the top speed would be about 120 miles an hour. And that's the fast planes. So they, they can't carry that much. Yes? Warren, can you go walk us through the parts of the infantryman's uniform? Oh, okay, equipment? sure. Okay. And in fact, I'll use this one here. This is, he's standing up taller. Of course, um, ah, of course, that's called the overseas cap. You didn't get issued that till you were overseas. <coughs> and that is so you can fit it. Hmm. Where'd the steel helmets go? Probably looking at. They're in the it. library. There's one on that on the dummy right in front of you. Oh yeah, so you could fit. It would fit under the steel helmet. So that's how we adopted that. Okay. Now the wool right here. Now this right here is the shoulder patch, and these shoulder patches. This is for the 86th Division. Um, they were adopted by. Um, most American units except one after the armistice. This right here is a discharge strike. So you know, uh, World War II you had the ruptured duck that shows you were discharged. Well, this uh, is a discharge. This person's out of the army. That's so you can wear your uniform home and not be harassed by NCOs or officers. Cause but you can still be proud and wear your uniform home. But that's a discharge strike. Um, this means six months of service overseas. So that's an overseas strike down here. And let's see if he's got a wound. Nope, doesn't have a wound. If he had one here, it'd be a wound. But um, of course, they've got the your rank 
if you're an officer, goes here. Um, and then you also have, like in collar, it'll show, have US on one side, and then your branch. This is signal. Or no, this is transportation, I'm sorry, on this one. Crossed rifles, of course, means uh, infantry and so forth. And of course, uh, they wear breeches. So yeah, they, the pants flare out. Um, of course, hobnail boots. But, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, the 1910 pack. Okay, developed in 1910, and um, this pack was hated by the troops, which means that you have to make it for a long time to prove that it's not a bad idea. What I'm trying to say is the troops hated it, but someone who designed it and sold the idea, said it was good, so American soldiers had to use this even up into World War II, even though nobody liked it. <laughs> Life is like that. So anyway, in here, in the top, you would have your uh, mess kit. Yep, your knife, fork, and spoon. Underneath, you have your entrenching tool, your shovel. Um, your rations are right in here, hard bread and things like that. Your bayonet and scabbard go on the side here. And then here you have your blanket roll and your uh, shelter half, you know, half a tent, and underwear and pegs and stuff like that. So the problem is with this pack is you have to roll up everything's so perfect to fit it in there. And who has time? And so this is a time I didn't do that. But there's all the, you have to fold it just right and it looks just. But who has the time? So, and then of course your ammunition goes here and you have 10 rounds or 10 bullets per pocket. And then of course the first aid pouch and this is the first war that each American soldier carried a first aid kit. It's just a bandage. <laughs> That's all it is. Any, did they have any iodine or anything in there as well? Nope. Wow. Well, you, so you don't touch the, the uh, cloth with your hands. You touch the outside so you don't contaminate it. And then your canteen and your canteen cup. And um, that cup I've been drinking out of, you know, the canteen fits down into it. So that's the pack. So they had that style with the cup that fit underneath the canteen in World War One. Yep, and World War II, they had a, and yeah. Korea, and, Korea, and Vietnam, yeah. and I Desert Storm, they had it as early as World War I. and OIF, you know, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Of course, um, fighting in the trenches, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, a rifle with bayonet was usually too long to maneuver in a trench. And uh, so, and also when you're fighting, if you stick somebody with this, it might stick in and not come out, which is a bummer for both. So, <laughs> what, what they... You pull the trigger then. You could, yeah, <laughs> if you weren't out. You could, yeah, that's one way to do it, but still, um, they, they figure out other ways. Now, the Germans were really adept at using entrenching tools. Yeah, they liked sharpening up entrenching tools to fight with. The British liked to use spiked clubs and uh, so forth. Of course, Americans, we developed a lot of these different types of trench knives. And, you know, this one... You know, you're, it's made to, to hit the man and break his jaw, and then you get him with the knife when he goes down. So is that, is that standard issue? It wasn't a standard issue, but uh, they did issue them. Okay. But uh, so they they were quite common at one time, and uh, so yeah, so that's uh, for for fighting close up. Um, of course, grenades. 
the uh, uh, grenades when the war began um, were improvised devices, you know, tobacco tins and sardine cans and stuff filled with powder and shrapnel. Uh, one of the things that they call a hairbrush grenade. It's sort of like a ping pong paddle. It has a handle or just like a slingshot handle and you put a, a tin of tobacco you know, filled with nails and you have um, a fuse and you light it with a cigar. So a lot of times with those early bombing parties they had cigars in their mouth. You know, so they could light the fuse quick and throw it. Which causes a problem because when the enemy sees the lighted cigars coming, it's like, oh, this is not good. Let's shoot at those uh, points of light. So then they developed like the German potato masher hand grenade you know, with the handle and then the other different types of grenades. So yeah, grenades came into their own in the fighting. Um, of course, a uh, German bayonet. Now this is an engineer's bayonet. So it's got a, uh, it's uh, got a saw on the back just for sawing timber and so forth. <coughs> Yeah. Now another thing, ah, I'll pass the coat around, so then you can really appreciate today's lightweight fabrics. Now remember, it may seem light, just quick lifted, but think of wearing it all the time, and think about it when it gets wet. Between that and the heavy shoes yeah. and the helmet, yeah. really like, yeah. and a lot of force <laughs> on the mouth and the And uh, here's the uh, shovel. <laughs> now, so, the, of uh, course, the United States, um, we mostly fought against Germany. Uh, we did have some troops on the Italian front. They may have fought the Austrians. But there's uh, one other adversary that we fought in World War I, during World War I, you may not think of. <coughs> no, we didn't fight them. The Russians. The Russians. Uh, and um, some of you cold warriors might remember this. And um, we ended up as part of a force up in Archangel in northern Russia. We were under uh, the British, and we had a regiment up there that uh, ended up fighting the Bolsheviks. They were there from the uh, summer of 1918 to the summer of 1919. In fact, a number of the men were actually from Milwaukee. And um, so... Uh, Yep, they were there to get guard Allied supplies, and they, uh, it's really murky, but there was some fighting against the Russians. Of course, we forgot about that, but the Russians didn't, um, so, and so forth. So, uh, you, Excuse me. Yes? How did the Germans in America respond to the war? I mean, it was, this was first generation German, you know, right, German right. Americans, right? Yes, and, um, well, the... Um, Yeah, let's see. How did I... One thing that um, happened during World War I is uh, the American public got very anti-German. So there was burning of German books, the suppression of the German language, uh, mob violence against German Americans. Um, I'm in this book here, and it's too small to show you, but it shows who voted against going to war. And you notice that in the book it'll show that Wisconsin wasn't overwhelming in its support to go to war against Germany. Go figure. Yes. Oh, got to speed up. Uh-oh, here comes the cane. Let's see. The gong. So, see, but basically the Germans... German-Americans did fight for the United States 
Were there many that went back to Germany to fight? With the not that I know of. Okay. By that time, they couldn't go anyway. They couldn't go anyway because Germany's blockaded. <coughs> yeah, so they stayed here if they did, and most of them did fight. Um, they could opt out if they wanted to, but few did. You know, if you were an enemy alien, uh, you could opt out and not go. But uh, um, most fought for their uh, adopted country. We didn't have anything happen to like how the Japanese Americans were sent off to the camps during World War II. Well, they had, they had some. They had some. Yeah, you know, not, not large like that. But if you were suspicious, remember, um, and it started in World War One, and then of course the Palmer raids and stuff. There was, you know, you couldn't speak out against the war or anything. So there were a number of people jailed. Yeah, it, it, it clamped down really hard during the war. Yes. My grandfather uh, immigrated in uh, right after the 1871 war. He was in for the Yeah, Franco-Prussian War. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Anyway, my dad always told this story, and my dad was probably about 18 in 1918, that how often the government came down to interview him, where have you been, who you talking to, what kind of magazines do you subscribe to. Mm -hmm. So they kept a close eye on some Germans. Yes, and there's also the government used the opportunity to, um, oh, I guess go after socialists and unionists and you know for you know, trade unions and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always read that uh, the backlash against Germans in communities like Cincinnati, Louisville, even Milwaukee was uh, much much more severe in World War One than it was in World War Two. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you know how many men were killed from Monroe County in World War One? That would be a Jared Roll question. <laughs> it was in the 40s. Okay. The 40s. <laughs> yeah. Is this the original entrenching tool? Oh, no, I've been found out. No, that's the, no, it's not. Eventually, they put a hinge in there. Oh, yeah, well, that, that is a, a copy of the original. The real, that's what we used. It wasn't until World War II we had the hinged one that we copied from the Germans. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I guess we got to cut it off now. Sorry that if there's no questions, I, if I missed anything uh, while you're eating the cookies and stuff like that, uh, feel free to come up and look at some of this stuff close. And uh, I think we'll, what we're going to do is we're going to ask Ward just to hang out here at the history room until the end of the year, and you can come in any time and ask him. Yeah, that's right. Can I give you a so yeah. we could have like a, a 1918 Christmas. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. Like. Yeah, we have like influenza masks. Oh, God. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, we're thankful to many of our volunteers who have been researching World War One for us, going through old newspapers and finding these articles that talk about uh, burning of German bur uh, German uh, church books and uh, making sure that everybody's doing their part and being patriotic and being suspicious of one another. It's all very real. It was in Monroe County, too. Uh, Spanish, or the Spanish flu took many lives and wiped out whole families. And uh, if you want to learn more about that, we've been collecting that information over the past year and a half so that we can read that today. Uh, read that now and learn more about it. Uh, for anybody else who wants to learn more, uh, Richard Piper published a book, The Great War Comes to Wisconsin. This just came out last year. We do have copies for sale in our gift shop if you're interested more in more in how uh, the war affected Wisconsin and how we were involved. But could you just help me give a hand to Ward because he's got a Uh, but I'll just say that, you know, after World War One, well, you know, this century is shot, and hopefully the next one will be better. <laughs> it, it set the stage for a lot of stuff that happened afterwards. We didn't come back to that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. But, Ward, you'll be you'll hang out for a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So that, okay, so again, we're going to have refreshments. We're going to just let people clear a little bit. We'll move some chairs out of the way. We'll bring out some cookies and some juice. So don't take off. You don't have to go fast. We're going to be around. You can take a closer look at things. Thank you again for coming.